Although invisible, it was apparent to Midoriya that a dark cloud had sent upon their queen's future. With dull, puffy eyes, a slightest blonde face, and lips curved down, Midoriya watched as Yin walked towards the river, her arms wrapped around Bakugos for support. Such gesture arouses Midoriya, for he thinks that Yin may collapse any time soon, and for a cruel reason. Poor Yin, whispered Midnight beside him. Midoriya looked back to see Midnight frowning solemnly as she watched their queen. His eyes soon fell over the noble, around oh the nobles around them to see that all of them mirrored a solemn look on their expression and their condolence. It was all so sudden. The memory is still clear in Midoriya's head. It was days ago, the day that Bakugo and Yin were expected to return home safe in one piece. But seeing as what is happening right now, that isn't the case. Midoriya can still remember it most vividly, the way the double doors to the palace were slammed open. The rush and the horror of seeing everyone bloodied and battered. The worst of them was Yen. Blood caked her dress and hands. She was crying and screaming, holding on to Bakugo as she repeated the same words over and over again. I lost them. Her cries haunted the palace for days. Yin had lost her child, and she blamed herself. For it became sh because she kept believing that she had saved them. That she could have not been too late if it wasn't for her being so horrified to the point of paralyzation after being stabbed by Cammy. That is if she hadn't frozen back then. She could have spared a few seconds in healing herself to save their child. But she was too late. Even after she had healed herself, the child inside her, so fragile and little, had sadly already died. To add to her misery, Cammy had used Yin's moment of vulnerability to escape, and they still couldn't have found her. We committed the body to the peace of the grave. We entrust them into your hands. Priest Ayama's words spreaded to fade within Midnight's ears as he snuffed all his focus towards Yin, who, now stood closer by the river, she bent down. The scholar caught a glimpse of a small wooden box in her hands, and it disappeared as soon as she slowly set it down on the water. From dust you came, to dust you shall return. Even from afar, Midoriya could see the way Yin's body was wrecked by her sobs. Her eyes were silent, but they were refused to let go of the box in a scream of her griefing heart. A scream that tells she is broken and she can't move on just yet. At the moment of death and on the last day. Hmm. Eventually, Yin has to let go. She did with so overwhelming grief and shaking hands. Agago wrapped his arms around to prevent his wife from collapsing down as they watched, watched the river rush the box further and further away from them. Perhaps it was just Midoriya's notion, but as the box containing their unborn child disappear, he could feel that Yin's hopeful heart had gone away with it. Glacia must pay. We shouldn't have trusted those northern bastards. <sighs> King Todoroki is nothing but a liar. Oathbreaker. Midoriya has heard nothing but angry cries from coming from up to nobles. That's all they're put on the table so far, ever since the meeting started. He understands that everything is tense after the funeral, and that the most dreadful about Glacia being the prime suspect of the incident has reached every ear in Igneous. But Midoriya believes in reason. My lords, Midoriya started, 
I wish our queen justice, and that Glacia should have paid for their betrayal. But they do not need to be paid with blood. We must be reasonable as to think that if we are to start a war with them now, we would also pay much blood, and we've already lost the most valuable we have. The hall went silent, but only for a moment, as the nobles all chose to see no reason. What do you mean they do not need to pay with blood? I say they should. Hmm. You say it so yourself. They took our heir, and not even that bastard Todoroki's blood could amount for it. Being responsible cannot give our queen and her child the justice they deserve. We must go north and at that time find the traitor, Kami, who was sided with the enemy. Kami is now being punished and branded as a criminal. We must wait until she is found, and that goes the same for the north. Nonsense. We must make haste, find Kami, and hang her along with the northern murderers. I agree. We must. Now it's Midoriya's turn to reclaim silence. In the depths of his mind, he knew they only were practically right. There's no reasoning with an enemy who killed first, and Glacia may not have killed Igneous's king nor a queen, but they slain the heir before it could even take its first breath into the world. Midoriya tried to stick with reasons, for it is his duty as a scholar, but Midoriya also has a duty as Yen's friend, but... A less traditional part of him thinks that Glacia had committed an unforgettable crime. They should pay whatever by a mound of gold nor a river of blood. They should pay. They should be on their knees. But Mr. Midoriya could be right. It is the peak of winter, and we all know it is not wise to attack the north during the winter. Our men had no training in such conditions. A small reasonable voice has finally dominated the unsoundable cries. The noble has Midoriya's stand, and the others seem to consider it. The scholar, however, found no pleasure in it. He's too torn to take a soldier's side, and only delude himself that it is at least his job to think that a war will designate to Igneous right now. The noble started to exclaim in words and alternatives, but in the end, they decided to turn to the man who deserved all the say in this matter. We must let King Baka go decide. All eyes were directly towards the king, at the further end of the table. Midoriya looked worriedly as Bakugo made no move, not a twitch nor a stutter. He remained in the same position he had assumed since the start of the meeting. He rested an elbow on the table, and his fists supported his jaw. His ha eyes remained on no one in particular, not even an object, and it's obvious that his mind is far from this meeting his back hunch on the weight and sadness of losing, a child he never got to meet. Especially, the hall has held in most quiet state. No one moved nor tried to say anything. They were waiting for their king. It was all a long wait, but finally, Bakugo uttered his words. Just the first words of his entire meeting. I've already made my decision. Those were also his last words as a king, who carried the same cloud as his wife, retreated from the meeting. It has become so unbearably cold all of a sudden, and empty. Yin could have given credit towards the falling snow of winter outdoors, where it is not of her own ice that has gladed her heart. So despite her privileges of being able to sit by a blazing fire, and she wraps in layers, nothing could thaw the coldness that has set within her. Your Majesty, Uraka's voice faded into the background as Yin kept her stillness of her gaze on the powdered cobblestone of the palace grounds. Y your bath is ready. Even the scolding water didn't help. Yin plagued herself deeper into the bath Uraka had prepared her. Her fingers danced between the barriers of the water, and she said, Still cold. Uraka furred her brows, worried, yet she proceeded to come forward and dip her hand in the water. Uraka winced upon contact with the scolding water. It's already hot, your majesty. I'm afraid you'll burn yourself. Oh. Yin can only reply as she started to drench the reality again. 
the thought of burning temperature her so long as it can rid her of the coldness. She can feel Uraka still standing by the tub, but she may not have been able to bear the silence and the shatter far away look on Yin's face. The last thing that Yin heard was Uraka's trembling voice telling her she will go prepare her clothes. It was when Uraka shut the door behind her that Yin flinched. Ripples formed around her as she moved and she started, stared at the door where her friend has appeared to. She felt bad all of a sudden for her grief and had also poisoned those who were around her. When Yin came back to watch the snow fall from the sky, she heard the door open once again and made a note in her mind to innovate conversation with Uraka to ease attention. But when she turned, she wasn't greeted by the brunette, but instead her husband, who had came and started to look at her with that mirrored that mirrored her pain. And there goes the tears that sprung her eyes. Bakago closed the door and started to take careful steps towards her. Before he could reach the, the side of the tub, a tear already had fallen in Yin's tired eyes. It's so cold, she trembled. So, so cold. He stood close beside the tub, and this has been the second time in the while he was this close to her ever since their loss. The first time was during the funeral, where he supported her, but before all that, Bakugo and Yin had been distant. I'll get Uraka to add more fire and water, he said lowly. Yin stopped before he could. No, that's not that, Katsuki. Bakugo turned and stopped. Upon the meeting of their gaze, they both understood. The blonde knelt beside the tub and dipped his finger into the water. The steam of the water is giving off touch his nose and he scrunched his face while looking away. It is cold, he said, moving his fingers in the water and eventually moving it to hold Yen's hand. And painful and empty, like a part of me. A part of me went and never came back. Yen started to sob and I cut her words as she spoke. And it's all my fault. Bakugo's eyes snapped towards her, brows furrowed in confusion, and the need to tell her otherwise. Why would you say that? Don't say that. It's not your fault. It's my fault, Katsuki. I... No, no, it's not. It's never your fault. No. It is because I... I don't want to hear you say that again. But it's true. Bakugo blinked between Yin's hysteria. The water was disturbed upon her instance, as she let go of his hand, and she might as well bathe in the t many tears she has started to shed. It's true. It's my fault because I've been horrible to our child. The blonde to chose to say nothing more, and Yin took all the time she was given to pour out her withheld feelings. The first time I ever found out I was with child, I dreaded it, and that makes me horrible. I tried to, to get rid of myself of it, and that makes me horrible. Bakugo remained still, eyes wide, his lips shut tight, his mind stunned by the many, by the new information he was given. Yin could see the terrible trembles that rock his shoulders. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. She wailed. Perhaps because of it, the gods saw it fit that I don't deserve to be a mother. Because why should I be given a child I never wanted? Her husband looked down and refused to meet her eyes. She wanted him to lash out and yell at her because she thinks that she deserves it. However, Bakugo did nothing of that. Instead, he merely asked her, But did you not cherish them in the end? Yin sobbing halted, and she looked dumbfounded, staring at her husband with red eyes and wet cheeks. <sighs> we knew that we would never have a great start in our marriage, and our shitty relationship may have been the reason for you not wanting it.
But that doesn't matter anymore, Yin. What matters to me now is that we're on good terms with each other. We, fuck, even more cherished our child together. And I knew those moments were true. With what matters, Yin? He raised his hand and placed them on both sides of her face to have her eyes meet his. You've come to love our child. That's why you're crying and mourning. That's why you're cold and empty. Katsuki, no. Yin whined, knowing very well the reason behind her trying to get rid of her child before. You may never deserve the child you never wanted, but you deserve the child you've come to love. Despite carrying weight in her concern, Yin decided to unburden her soul towards Bakugo's words. It felt so wrong to hear him say something right because deep down, Yin has no many has so many regrets about her coop, her child, and Bakugo. Katsuki, hi. Once again, she was possessed with guilt, and within a hair's beneath away from confessing her sins to her husband, but once again, the words has chosen for Yin to suffer. Her husband has spoken before her. I will have the ones who are at fault here. Bakugo's face no longer mirrored Yin's disheveled look. He looked as if he willed himself the determination that now burns and awaits destruction aside him. A telltale sign that Bakugo Katsuki wanted something. And he will not stop until he gets it. What do you mean? Yin asked. The tranquility he just brought her is so soon disappointed, replaced with dread. I will go to Glacia, Bakugo stated, for you and our child. Yin's other fear has come to form her raging and mourning husband. Bakugo will go to Glacia, and that could result in a war. While a part of her is begging for justice for their child, a part of her is no longer wanting to hate to foster for it, has hate between two countries that took her child away from her. Yin didn't want her child to be the reason for a bloody war, for it is a horrible remnants to offer. She's torn, so, so torn to which side she should stand. This is why Yin has locked herself in her room, pacing around all day and night to try and solder at her stand, but there's no use. She opted for hearing pieces of advice from she trusts the most. Midori was just as undecided upon the matter as Uraraka. Both wanted to see Todoroki kneeling on his pool of blood, but at the same time, they didn't want it to cost their own people's blood. However, this morning Yin had just woken up from a midnight. In her horrible dream, she had revealed that the moment upon she got stabbed and lost her child. Yin had lost all reason, and her mourning is slowly starting to eat. By rage, and the thought of supporting her husband in a war had crossed her mind. Beknownst to her, strings have been pulled, and it came when she received visitors. That same morning, Your Majesty, Queen and King of Magnus has come to visit. Uraka said as soon as she entered Yin's chambers. The haired-colored woman turned to the door and saw the familiar and comforting face of her mother. Immediately, the tears went rolling down her face as she ran to her mother. Oh, my sweet, sweet child. Her mother cooed as she ran a hand on her back for comfort. Yin felt like a child, all lost and wounded, as she pulled away and stared at her mother with sadness, which she mirrored endlessly. Her mother cupped her cheeks, and Yin found warmth in them. However, the moment was short-lived when her father stepped inside the room. Yin stared at him with caution, and that pondered her mother to have them seated in particular of her chambers. <sighs> we ought to visit for the funeral, but it's been hard. Her mother's luring voice cut through the sound of burning wood at Uraka's footsteps by serving them tea. Your father's health had never been better, and it broke my heart to hear that his visit with you the last time didn't go exactly well. And there were also the raids, and now this. Oh, Yin, it pains me to see you like this. Yin wanted to avoid the topic of her loss as much as possible. R raids? What raids? Haven't you heard? 
bandits are raging villages from the north, and they're moving further south. We ought to be cautious with traveling, then. Hmm? From the north? Yeah. It seems the harsher the winter gets, the crueler the northerns become. It was the first time Yin had heard this, and to be fair, she was locked in herself in her room, so... Mm-hmm. She has been a mental note that despised mourning. The gods have made her queen have made her queen and that means she had lost her well had the duty to attend perhaps working can take her mind off her loss <laughs> i see i shall address that as soon as possible yin said and took a sip of her tea her father refused to look at her but whatever he said did not say a word to his daughter your husband should be doing all that yin glanced at the elephant per poison in her father's words her mother quickly panicked and ought to soften the tension. My dear, can you spare us some privacy, please? Her mother asked. Uraka and the, br the, the brunette hesitant before receiving an unsure nod from Yin. As soon as Uraka left, her mother wasted no time scolding her father. I must implore you not to say a word, husband. Gods, but our child has suffered enough. King Lin went quiet and retreated into his own little corner. Despite his quorums, Yin had wished he would allow his, this moment to become the fur further he was once before. Yin, her mother had clapped her hands. Your mind and spirit have both grown wearily. Mother, please, I do not want to speak of this. I know, child, you've suffered enough, perhaps too much. I shall not batter you, but if I may help lift your spirits... I must. I hate seeing you like this. Yin looked up and met the teary eyes of her mother. She was once again driven to the tears and could not nod, well, could only nod, to accept the offer. If anything, Yin needs help. I brought all kinds of tea from the far east. These should help you in peace. The day went on with her mother ordering nothing but care. She had been careful as not to poke a sensitive matter Yin had not wanted to be touched with. Her father had remained silent the entire time and eventually had enough of being shunned by the two women in the room and left no longer after the conversation about teas and baths. Queen Lin did not stop nursing until she got Yin in bed eventually and retreated to the chambers given to her and her husband. The treatments of her mother had worked wonders on Yin's physical health, but there's no mending a broken mind and soul. She had to remain awake in her bed, only relishing the comforts of incense and fire. It's still cold within her. Yin decided to get off her bed and sit by the fire. There she amused herself and how lovely the fire danced. The same liveliness she wished she had never lost. What would life be if she had never married Bakugo Katsuki? Perhaps would be remain happy but immoral and immigrant here she had grown and learned a lot despite of being the cost of her happiness either way there are no misprints though her thoughts were cut off by the sound of soft knocks coming from her door before she could say anything and opened and in came her father yin he called out may i sit next to you yin wrapped her robes around herself and nodded her father took a seat across from her, sitting, the, setting the candelabra he carried next on the table. What do you want? she asked coldly. Your, her father sighed. I rarely doubt your mother's care, and perhaps I should take this. You should not look. Oh, you still do not look better. If you're here to talk about my child, then I ask you to leave. I am, but I will not leave. He hesitant and yin glared. Unlike your mother, I learn that it's best to comfort your chips. Yin scoffed. Aren't you the same man who got drunk and insulated himself in your kingdom in chaos? Her father clenched his fist and remained his composure. Those are mistakes I'm willing to admit, but I will not ask who taught me better. Who? It was you, Yin. For once, Yin was cut off guard by her father. She breathed in and out before leaning in her chair. She had now begun to think that maybe her father had learned something during their unpleasant encounter last time. I've been a coward and you were right. I was so wrong for letting you shoulder all of it. And because of it, you've suffered. But at the same time, you've grown. I'm proud of you for having become a, 
strong, unlike me, my dearest, he said, which is why you must allow me to make it up to you. How? Yen asked, her guard is slowly being taken down. Her father took his time, and he sat there with no ominous air around him, and he finally said, You are in danger, Yin. Those words didn't weigh much yet because of Yin's great curiosity, but it's not like this has been the first time our life was put on test. Danger? How? She asked again. Your husband? He asked, and Yin rolled her eyes, but her father gave time to interrupt. He's been taxing people, neglecting the concerns about the raids, and is openly starting a war against other countries. Deep down, she dreaded what he heard. What she heard about Bakugo's recent behavior, but it was like the first time she met him. However, Yin is more inclined towards the fact that her father may only be playing in his best interest, that her grief had not passed on well. He plans to seek justice for our child, is what she only could say, and by doing so, he's willing to drag his kingdom to the ground. Bakugo knows he's doing. He's in charge. Did he? Yin shrunk into her chair while her father leaned forwards to press the weight onto his words. You know too, child, that he has gone back to his old self, taxing people, ignoring his counsel, and waging bloody wars. The haired-colored female couldn't say anything. Her breathing became labored, and she glared even harsh at her father. And when that happens, Yin, when war has spent all of Igneous's blood, all fingers will point to you. Her breathing hitched, and she felt the beat in her heart had stopped momentarily. Yin shifted and only could mutter a little, almost incompatible words. Uh, me? Yes, you, Yin. Her father stood and walked over to her. A king not ready for a kingdom not ready for war will be driven to mud by a mad king. His madness streams from you and your child. Once it's all over, you will forever be reminded. As the queen who brought forth a bloodbath and the memory of her child will be discarded. Fear which makes a man lose all reason has come to drench upon Yin's spirit and mind. Her eyes stunned upon having opened so wide it shocked and she felt like she'd been robbed of air to breathe. Her father took a step forward, leaned down and pinned his gaze upon her, eventually imprisoning Yin with calculational words. Can't you understand, my dear daughter? Your husband didn't change, and you will be the end of this kingdom. You must do something. Wide and fearful eyes stared back at the king, whose eyes reflected the shine of admiration in his words. He has wrapped his daughter around his finger. Or everything will be your fault. Damn, your guys' dad really sucks. Really making you seem to be the villain. Because, well, we don't actually need a coop. If you have already figured out the plan, well, if you can do it out without coop, well, hey, it kind of worked, and now, uh-oh, we're here, so who? But, anyways, I hope you guys enjoy this. Sorry that this story is coming to a sad ending, but I hope it does change. I do have to say the story is not finished. The person who's making this is in college, so, um, there's so give this person time please uh i think i have a couple chapters left so i will be either a looking for a new story to read or b taking a little break from these chapters but anyways i love you all so much bye Mwah!